I'm Katie Buckley and I'm with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. I'm the pollinator health coordinator, which means I get everything to do with pollinators that doesn't have to do with pesticides or hive registration. I'm running the State Pollinator Health Task Force and that was supposed to be the only thing that I was doing uh, this year. And then we got in the space of a week in December last year, uh, Houdini fly and Asian giant hornet, which both impact pollinators and for reference, the last time we had an invasive species that threatened pollinators in the state was in the 80s and it was rural mite. Um, so Houdini fly ended up being a slightly less of a problem than obviously Asian giant hornet, however it is definitely still a problem. Uh, Houdini fly affects mason bees. Now mason bees are used to pollinate uh, orchards, primarily apples, uh, pears, peaches, nectarines, cherries, stuff that blooms really early in the season. They're early spring flyers, some of the earliest solitary bees that get out there. So you might use mason bees with honeybees, you might use them instead of honeybees. Um, they're basically an alternate pollinator. They are, per bee, incredibly efficient pollinators of um, the trees that they pollinate. So you can use like 10 mason bees to do the job that a hive of honeybees might be doing. Now it used to be that they were really expensive back in the 60s. Nowadays they're much cheaper and it's become a much more popular alternate. They are solitary nesters so they don't necessarily come back to the same place every year. You can provide housing for them that hopefully they will use. So this is a mason bee house? This is an example of a mason bee house. They come in a lot of different um, configurations than this. This is kind of the overall pollinator house. But this section right here is something that mason bees would use. In December, when we discovered that this was a problem, it was actually reported to us by Dave Hunter of Crown Bees, who runs a mason bee business. He provides houses like, like this, um, but he also provides mason bees. Um, you can, because they overwinter at, in their pupil cases, you can basically go through a tray like this. Backing is important. It keeps uh, other types of parasites from going in the back. Um, there are parasitic wasps uh, that are native that impact these too. And because these are trays, you can open them up and you can actually pull out the pupa um, in the winter and then look at to see if they have diseases, look to see if they have parasites. Um, it's really easy to do that. You put them on a light tray, shine the light up through them, and you can actually see the differences between the healthy pupa and parasitized pupa. And so... What, and what's, uh, what's up with the Houdini fly? So the Houdini fly, when they were doing that, uh, for the last two winters, when they've been opening these up, um, a very tiny percentage instead of having either a parasitized pupa or a healthy pupa or even a diseased pupa, they started finding certain cells that were just full of maggots. A mason bee pupa looks kind of like a maggot. All bee and wasp larvae really do, but they're a fairly large one. And mason bees, because they're solitary, they'll build one single cell in this, um, and it'll be about that size, and they'll form a pollen ball that's put together with nectar, um, and they'll lay a single egg on it. So there will be one pupa, or one larva, in that cell. And then in the spring, they'll emerge from that cell. So when you find a cell full of 20 maggots, <laughs> you know something's wrong. deeply wrong. Um, so the Houdini fly is a kleptoparasite. That means that they're, they don't actually eat the bee egg or the bee larva itself, they eat its food. But what essentially happens is if you get too many of them, too many eggs laid in a cell, they will starve the bee larva to death. They don't have enough food to complete their life cycle and they die. How do you control Houdini fly? So the way that we figured out um, is the best way at the moment to control the Houdini fly is 
basically to do just that is to get these uh, stackable trays if you have mason bees um, and you open them up in the winter you look for the Houdini fly and if you find them you kill them now the cool thing is basically you have cleaned out this whole block once you've done that you now have the mason bee pupa in their little cocoons and you can just store those in the fridge until you're ready to have them pollinate in the spring again. When they started discovering this, like I said, it was from one company. They have people that produce mason bees for them, essentially from British Columbia down through Oregon. And the scary thing was they started popping up through all of those, basically randomly all the way down the coast at about the same time. So where they came from it's Europe, it's a European pest of mason bees. They're really devastating to mason bees there and probably one of the reasons why honeybees are so prominent in Europe is because the mason bee there have so many problems with this fly. Um, it can take out like 60% of them in a year. Uh, obviously we're trying to keep that from um, happening, 